Hello and welcome to the South Stoke House Lockdown Podcast. My name's Ashley Crapp. This podcast is made up of interviews with some of the people who lived at South Stoke House during the first year of coronavirus restrictions in the UK. They were recorded at the end of March 2021 and consist of people's experiences of the changes that we all went through as we had to deal with some of the biggest restrictions on our freedoms that we'll probably ever experience in our lives. At some points we weren't allowed to leave the house apart from to do some exercise for one hour a day. Uh, At other points it was less restrictive, we just had to wear face coverings when we went into shops and take tests when we went travelling, things like that. And at other points the restrictions put in place by the government were plain ridiculous such as having to have a substantial meal when you went into a pub with far too much time given to debating as to whether or not a pork pie qualified as a substantial meal. Now I'm recording this introduction at the end of February 2022. The UK government has recently announced that soon we will be coming to the end of all coronavirus restrictions in the UK. Um, one of the first countries in the world to end all restrictions completely. So we'll see how that pans out. These interviews, though, are a reflection on people's experiences of that first year of coronavirus and an insight into how we all adjusted to live in a way that we never had to live before. My first interview was with poet and collaborative artist Alison Hallett. Alison. Ashley. Welcome. <laughs> welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, so we're sitting here almost a year to the day after me, you and Jenny and Philip sat in front of the television, um, like many other people across the country and watched Boris Johnson um, tell us all that the country was going into lockdown um, because of the coronavirus. How has it been? How has your year been? Uh, wow. It's quite a big question. Um, it's been various. Various. Yeah. So kind of kaleidoscopic in some ways. It's my life has gotten smaller in as much as I don't travel. Yeah. Um, and I haven't been traveling anywhere. And at the same time, other things have opened out. It's, re- it's really strange. It's like on the, on the physical plane. My life has shrunk, um, but thanks to the magnificent Zoom, um, I do work with people all over the world. Yeah, because ordinarily in your working life, you travel quite a lot to different places around the world, reading poetry, yeah. writing poetry, delivering lectures, um, and like the rest of us, you've been stuck in Somerset. Um, so how did you manage to adapt your work? Well, I was lucky because I'd been working on Zoom for maybe a year and a half, two years before the pandemic hit. Um, I've been collaborating with a movement artist, uh, Deborah Black, who lives in New York, and she's been teaching on Zoom for a long time. And I went to some of her classes and then I ran short writing workshops in her movement classes. And I was completely sceptical in the beginning, thinking, how on earth can you teach movement? through a computer but it worked so when the pandemic hit I put something on Facebook actually I thought I would maybe run a writing workshop I thought maybe I'll just do a week Uh, so I put something on Facebook saying is anybody interested in a creative writing workshop and I wanted to offer it as a support as somewhere that people could come and write and feel that, you know, there was some place in the world where 
they could be creative, I guess, you know, so they might not be able to go anywhere, but there would be a space once a week. And amazingly, I'm still running two groups uh, a year on. They're, they're still going really strong. And that's been amazing, actually. And I've run them on a donation basis because I didn't want anyone to be excluded. And I have people in America, in Spain, Coventry, Glasgow, Bristol. That's been extraordinary, actually. And you've never met any of these people? I've met some of them. <laughs> right, okay. But not all of them. Okay. Yeah. And how does it feel to have um, online acquaintances? I love it. I think Zoom's amazing. And it's possible because we are writing together and reading poetry together. That's the focus. So it's always amazing to come together with people in that way and see what they think and they feel. And I've just been able to bring lots of really exciting texts uh, to the groups. So it's been very good. That's nice. And I suppose in a way it's given you, it's not something that would have otherwise happened if you've got people from New York no. and Coventry and, no. and Spain, wherever. They would never have come to here weekly to do it. A chat, so that's uh, our poetry. And it's the same, I, I do mentoring as well. And again, I've got people all over the world uh, that I can work with. So that's really exciting. I've really liked that aspect Excellent. of the pandemic. So, one, you know, in, in some ways, I've maybe had more work than if the pandemic hadn't happened. And it's been regular work, which has not happened in my life for a long time. So regular times each week. Uh, but, you know, there have been real dips as well. I, I find in, in the pandemic at times, the I, there's been an emotional, um, I was going to say overload, but I don't know if it's overload, more of kind of the occasional emotional earthquake. <laughs> when <laughs> I just feel as if the ground has opened up and I've, I've fallen in and I've needed to just cry all day. That, that's been quite odd. That, that's why I think it's been various yeah. So some things have been really good, and then there have just been these emotional holes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where it's almost like that sense of a background of grief and trauma that I'm not seeing firsthand, but I know is out there. Um, yeah. yeah. So. so. Yeah, I, I see where you. Uh, yeah, I think various is a good is a good word. It's it's. I mean, it's interesting to to hear though how you've how you've managed to embrace um, the the kind of online world um, and make that work for you in 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 a way that it sounds really positive. So that's that's nice. Mm. Um, other things you've done this year, you've you've published a book. I've published a book. Yeah. In the in the year of lockdown, you've managed to manage to publish a book. So tell us a bit about Tilted Ground. Well, that was from a residency that I did in late November 2019. It's hard to remember years at the moment. I feel like last year was a year of suspension. Yeah, 2019, I was poet in residence at the Lyle Centre, uh, which is part of Harriet Watt University. So complete dream come true. I was working with rocks and geologists and I got to go in this amazing part of um, the university called the core store which is full of rock cores that have been drilled from I think it's nine miles deep in the earth and they only get these cores out once or twice a year and they happen to have them out the, the in the week that I was there so I got to see these extraordinary rocks and I met students and staff and also the well-being team it, it was a, a multifaceted residency and I also went on a great field trip to Kakodi uh, so we were in the field uh, with another geologist the, the whole thing was set up by Pat Corbett um, and I was in my element anyway the book came out of that the commission was to write three poems because I was only there for a week but I was possessed. And when when I was actually on the residency, quite often I'd be woken in the middle of the night, you know, three, four in the morning, and there would just be lines pressing through me. So I'd write them down, I'd jot them down. 
And yeah, I was just in a fever of writing, really. And when I came back, that carried on for a while. And when it came to it, I thought, oh my God, you know, I haven't got three poems here. I've got more like 40 or 50 poems. Well, in fact, I probably had about 70 and I lost um, 20 of them or so. When I say lost, I decided not to include. So, yeah, a book, a book was born from it. I, I said to Pat, you know, you can have three if you want or... You know, I've got enough for a manuscript and we could try and put a book together. So that's what we did. Um, yeah, I put a book together and Tilted Ground was the outcome of that. So we we published it. Yeah, I can't remember which month it was. Um, maybe in the summer. Maybe in the summer it came out. Excellent. So, yeah. So we are going to talk a little bit more about your work with Stones shortly, but do you want to give us a poem from Tilted Ground? I will give you a poem from Tilted Ground. I will give you a couple, I think. Um, very short one to begin with. Pick up a pebble. It will hold you together when nothing else can. Very nice. And I'll read you one from the Core Store, as I've been talking about uh, cause. So there, there are seven poems from the Core Store, and this is cause number six. The smell of oil. Rocks so drenched in scent, they beg to be sniffed. My heart blushes. What is a surface? I trace edges and plunge below. Strange, erotic affinities between fingertips and rocks. My hair drifts like weed. I am being translated. I think the core of my brain crawling out to meet the cause of the earth. The smell is not instantly sweet. It threads through my body, molecule by perplexed molecule. Oh, wow. lovely. That's from Core 6. It was really strange going into this Core Store. Uh, Core Store. Core Store. Core Store. And uh, I was like, what is that smell? You know, I could smell something. Um, and it was slightly cloying. And it was the smell of oil, which I hadn't anticipated. And I'm not sure I've ever seen oil in rock before. You know, I think of oil as viscid, viscous. I think of it as fluid. Uh, but when you see it in rock... Um, you know, it's just dark particles um, infusing the rocks. And you, you could smell it the moment you went in the room. Um, so that, that was quite extraordinary, to, you know, to be able to pick up these rocks and, and sniff oil. But obviously it wasn't fluid. It was in its form in the rock before it had been, you know, sucked out or anything like that. It was extraordinary. That is mad because I always had the image of oil being big liquid deposits underneath the... Well, I think it's that too. But yeah. obviously, the, you know, because rock is porous. Yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. going to have... Um, I mean, that's how you can also start finding out where the oil is if you start, you know, drilling for these cores. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and because it's porous, you, you're going to have that bleeding into the rock. Yeah. You know, it's not a... I don't think there's a solid line between where the oil's going to be and where it's not. So, yeah, yeah that was extraordinary. That, it, that, that perfume, that smell... It's intoxicating. Wow. Mm. Yeah, when I was at uni, we did a, a we looked at, um, I didn't actually go and look at any core samples, but we got, it's one of the ways they, they study climate change history. So we're looking at how sediment is built up for mm. things in different areas of the world. Um, so stones, <laughs> talked a lot about stones already. Um, it's a big part of your work. It is. Um, how did you start? Getting into stones as a poet. Oh my god! So twenty years ago, well, I worked. I worked with a letter carver and sculptor called Alec Peaver um, in the beginning, and he carved one of my poems into the pavement in Bath. So, but that that was the first time I'd ever worked with somebody who carved words into stones, and oh, it was just magic. It was extraordinary. And shortly after we'd worked together, I had a dream where my grandmother, my, my paternal grandmother, appeared in a dream and told me to go and climb a mountain uh, called Kada Idris. 
uh, which is in North Wales. It's in the Snowdonia range. And my, my grandmother had died about three months previously. Anyway, I thought, it's a dream. It's ridiculous. I don't climb mountains. And I was really busy. But her voice would not go away. So in the end, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go and climb this mountain. So I cancelled my work, hired a car, set off thinking, what on earth am I doing? Uh, got there, you know, pitched my tent, slept. And the next day I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go up Cadet Idris. And uh, halfway up, I came across this giant boulder and it just looked completely out of place. And while I was staring at it, this man came along you know, just said, hello, and what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm staring at this boulder because it just doesn't seem to belong here. And it turned out that he was a geologist, and he told me that what I was looking at was an erratic, which I'd never heard of before. And an, an erratic is a stone that breaks away from a mother bed, uh, got lodged in a glacier, and then travelled across the country. So, you know, when gorges and canyons were made, that was done by a glacier. And then when the sun came out again, or when it, the sun was hot enough and the ice melted, these stones dropped out. So I was just possessed by this. I thought, stones are the original travellers. You know, they have no concept of boundary or country in the terms, in, in the ways that human beings do. You know, I, I think our understanding of a boundary is so fallible. Uh, and I thought... In a way, stones know much more about this than we do. I mean, some of them travel in the sea. Yeah. They travel in all different sorts of ways. But I was just fascinated. But also because culturally, we often think of stones as being fixed, you know, solid as a rock or yeah. you know, something that won't move. And here I was being faced by these ancient travellers. So I applied to the Arts Council actually saying... I really want to make a project around the migration habits of stones. And I never thought they would go for it, but they did. I, I got a, an individual artist award and that began my work with migrating stones and it's still happening. Here we are 20 years later. 20 years later, I've cited five stones with a line of poetry carved into them uh, in different parts of the world. Yeah, so I've, I've travelled around the world with stones with a line of poetry carved into them and done a lot of other research along the way, yeah. Wow. And the latest word to come from this is, is Tilted Ground, but also... Also... The Stone Museum. The, my, the Museum of Migrating Stones, exactly. So that's the other lockdown thing that I really got into because I've collected so many stones over the years and I've also been given stones by other people because they know how much I love to work with stones. And I thought, you know, they've just been sitting in bags or in a big box. And I thought, you know, that's not really respecting them or looking after them. And so I thought, what can I do with them? And I can't remember how I first got the idea, but I thought, I know, I'll start making cushions for them to sit on. Because, you know, I think there are oldest ancestors the rocks and you know our bones are full of minerals that come you know that are in rocks and every day you know we the, the planet shoulders us so I think of the rocks you know we're, we're held up by the rocks of this planet and I thought how can I show gratitude for that or how can I have some kind of reciprocal relationship and I thought well these stones and rocks that I've got I'll make cushions for them and I'll get some boxes and put, you know, I'll, I'll give them a home. Uh, so I went to the works, which, you know, I thought, where, where can I get boxes? And somebody sent me off to the works, um, which was great because boxes are really cheap. So I've been finding boxes that the stones will fit into. And then I bought measures of different kinds of velvet. And for each stone I've made a little cushion, and then it now sits in a box. And whilst whilst I was doing it, because I've never read Joyce's Ulysses, I, I listened to Ulysses while I was making all of these cushions <laughs> um, for the stones. So the museum is being made. And, I mean, I've never made a museum before. I don't even know how you make a museum or who gets to make a museum, but it seems to be what I'm doing. Uh, I'm, I'm preserving the stories with the stones as well. 
Um, so now you you now you are the owner and curator of the, mig- <laughs> the Museum of Migrating Stones. Yeah, although it's always kind of tenuous whether or not I can say I'm the owner of the stones. I actually think it's the other way around. I think the stones are owners <laughs> of me because I, they seem to have dictated to me certain things that I would go off and do, and they're certainly going to outlive me. That, you know, my body will true. rot and go back into some kind of um, sedimented layer. So. We could say that I'm the owner of it, but I think the museum is more the owner of me. Fair enough. Yeah. You've brought some, a few exhibits with you from the, from the museum. So let's have a, have a look at these. Okay. Um, I'll just bring these little boxes over. So I, I just chose a tiny selection. Um, and in this, this first box which I'm opening now. So th- this is quite a small oblong box, maybe um, seven centimetres long and four centimetres wide. And it's got a, a petrol blue velvet cushion. And in it are two little white stones. When I say little, they're the size of, what are they the size of? Maybe a big pea. Imagine a big misshapen pea. That's the size of these stones. And they are from Albania. So the last time I was in Albania, we we were driving along um, and we had a puncture. Uh, there, the, the tire was punctured and we eventually um, managed to get to the nearest village. And luckily there was a man there who dealt with car tires. So I, I asked him if I could watch him mend the tire. Anyway... The, he had to break this stone. It was a whole stone. He broke it in half to get it out. But it was what had caused the puncture oh, right. <laughs> um, in Albania. So I've got two Albanian puncture stones in that box. Uh, in this box, this box is quite extraordinary, actually. So this, this is a square box with a dark green cushion. And in it, there's a stone... That's been shaped. It's the only stone in the museum that's more of a precious stone that's had some kind of shaping, shaping by a human hand. It's a garnet. And it was sent to me by somebody in New Zealand who I've never met, but I, we know somebody else in common. And when she heard about the project, she decided she would send me this garnet. It was her most precious stone. And I think she's been suffering with quite a lot of depression okay. during the lockdown. And when she heard about a museum of migrating stones, for some reason it just really lifted her heart wow. and her spirits. And she wanted to send me something very special. What do you mean by garnet? Sorry. That's... So it's a deep red stone. Oh, okay. Deep red stone. So it looks very sexy on its green cushion. <laughs> uh, oh, and this one, <laughs> this one's from Peru. So th- this... Uh, the ne- I'm in the next box now, uh, and it's it's a mountain shaped stone, and it's a piece of stone that my friends brought me back from Machu Picchu. So see here we are in this room, traveling the world. So we've yeah. been to Albania, Peru, New Zealand, <laughs> <laughs> and then the final one I've got here. I've got a little bag. It's one of those little bags that you sometimes get a bar of soap in. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I thought I would reuse it. And in this bag, I don't know if you could just hear that. So uh, these are really tiny stones. Um, I think there's 19 of them. And they're from the footwell of my car. Uh, There was one day when I just thought, I'm going to see how many little travellers, little hitchhikers I've got. Oh, I should have brought that poem to read. I've got a poem about stones hitching a ride in the heel of my shoe anyway the, these are the hitchhikers from my car I, I just emptied them out of the footwell one day just to see how many had gathered there so they're, they're living in that little soap bag yeah that's funny I they haven't got get, their cushion yet I always get those in my car mm-hmm. and now I'll never look at them in the same way again little exactly and once you start thinking about this and you start looking at them you start asking do they want to move you know, are they kind of getting in the sole of my shoe or the footwell of my car because they want to go somewhere? I mean, you know, it's very odd to only attribute humans or animals with uh, will or anything else. You know, because the planet has been here much longer than us. The, these stones are much, you know, they're millions, hundreds of millions of years old. 
So who knows? They probably like having a little journey. <laughs> and at the moment, they're just having a rest in the museum on that's, their cushions. On some nice, comfortable cushions. <laughs> on some nice, comfortable cushions. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's the other thing. And that's a, that's a work in progress. That's not finished yet. Okay. But we will wait to hear about the grand opening. We the... will wait to hear for the grand <laughs> opening. Yeah, I haven't quite figured out. Um, I'm sure there'll be snacks and music. <laughs> I don't really have any launches or openings without snacks or music. So uh, Maybe some lovely wine as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, lovely. Well, thank you for talking to us about your lockdown experience. It's a pleasure. And your, your Migrating Stones project. Um, and, yeah, just, just thanks, Alison. It's been lovely talking to you. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely questions and for inviting me to do this. And thanks to Ollie as well, who's been sitting there quietly um, <laughs> managing all the sound bits. Yeah, yeah thank you. So, producer Ollie, who without this, none of this would have happened. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> all right. So, that was Alison. Next up, I spoke to Sophie Smith, who, as we will hear, used the lockdowns as a chance to work on her practice as a ceramic artist. Sophie. Hi, Ashley. Thank you for joining me That's in okay. uh, the, the studio, the makeshift studio. That's okay. Um, so we are talking about lockdown as mm-hmm. we draw towards the end of um, the first year of coronavirus restrictions. Yeah. I say the first year, hopefully the only year, but um, <laughs> we'll see how that pans out. Um, I want to talk to you today about your biggest exciting project that you've done during yeah. lockdown. You've started your own business. Yeah. Um, so I actually started it in lockdown one when we weren't here. Um, and it was when lockdown was pretty serious lockdown and we weren't allowed to leave um, at all, really. Um, so me and Ollie were stuck inside a lot. And, and it was we were in our old flat, which was basically just like one giant room. And so I started, um, like, I've always made stuff, um, like, different things, like, with clay. Like, I did a um, clay course um, before lockdown at the college in Bath. And I've always liked making, like, printing T-shirts and clothes and things like that. So then when lockdown happened... Up until that point, I've been working at restaurants the whole time and restaurants don't really close for anything. Um, Well, that's what it felt like. (laughs) Um, And I've been working like really long hours. So I never had the chance to actually put some time into um, my art. So when lockdown happened, I took it as an opportunity to start. Excellent. So that's when Della Rossa (laughs) was first born. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of grown from there. So tell us uh, then about um, what you kind of touched on it there with the, the kind of two aspects really of Della Rossa. Yeah. So you do pottery and clothing. Yeah. So I wanted it to be a brand that um, I wanted to create kind of a brand rather than something really specific like Sophie makes this or Sophie makes that because... Um, then I can be quite broad with what I do. Um, so I made the name Della Rossa from, Della was the name of my cat when I was a kid. Um, and Rossa was my mum's maiden name. Um, I just thought it was quite a nice thing, putting those yeah. two things together. Um, so yeah, I do mostly ceramics. And um, so kind of just like, little pots and vases and um like mugs um and I also print um like draw designs and then have them made into silk screens and then I print the like t-shirts with them and what else do I do I block print um fabrics like I block print tote bags 
and I've done some painting on clothes and yeah just mostly ceramics and printing really excellent and you've just launched your spring summer 2021 catalogue catalogue yeah I have um yeah I feel like it's been I mean I guess it's I started it up in July that's um yeah that's when I started it um and I feel like now I've got a real clear idea of what I actually want it to be and when I started it it was just kind of an outlet for all of the random stuff I've been doing and um yeah now it feels like I'm actually getting to a point where I really like the way it's looking and yeah excellent so you a lot of the things that you make have a kind of practical purpose kind of mm-hmm. soap holders spoon holders things like that yeah that you also have some signature pieces so let's have a little chat do you want to tell us about the lockdown vase oh okay <laughs> um, yeah the lockdown vase um was I made it in lockdown one um but it's kind of been on a journey throughout the various lockdowns and its various stages of being um so I built it in lockdown um one and it was just basically a very large vase um and then I asked people I put a question out on Instagram saying um what symbol what things like what symbols represent lockdown for you to people that follow me on Instagram and loads of people replied saying different things so I carved those things into the vase um and then finally when things started um opening up again I could get it fired and then I had to wait until I got that back and then by the time I got it back to glaze it was locked down too (laughs) um and then I finally yeah I finally got it back and I'm pretty sure I got it back when it was all glazed and finished just before we went into another lockdown so really (laughs) really it's been a um yeah it's it's a good symbol of lockdown I think that I like it excellent and are there photographs of that on your website there aren't, but maybe I should actually. Yeah, this, I think I've posted some on my Instagram before. And I've also submitted it to um, Grace and Perry's Art Club um, TV show, um, which probably won't be on there, but you know, maybe. So if people want to see it, they can see it on your Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or what's your Instagram? Um, at Della dot Rossa. At Della dot Rossa, which is spelled. Della is D E L L A, and then Rossa is R O S S E R. There we go. Yeah. So Instagram, at Della. Della. Rossa, at yeah. or the website is Dellarossa.com. Dellarossa.com. So that's where you can find all of Sophie's wonderful goodies, including some other vases. This is a quick chat about those other vases. You've got three vases this time. Yeah, with. I. a lot of my work is based around um, kind of symbols and really simple things that we kind of draw a lot of meaning from. Um, and I like using those, um, like that's how I kind of, it's my, my thing in my work. Yeah. Um, so I did three mini vases, so many, they're like 25 to 30 centimeters tall. Um, and they all have different themes. So one of them's called hope and it's got an, an engraving of a bird, um, holding an olive branch and, um, a rainbow. And there's another one called Love, which obviously lots of hearts and um, some kissing birds. <laughs> and there's one called Strength, which is um, some mountains on there and um, like a pencil, I think, because some people find strength in expressing themselves through words. But yeah. Excellent. And those are available to buy. Yeah. Yeah. They're all on the website. All on the website. Yeah. So there we go, listeners. Della.rossa, that's on Instagram. Yeah, and Dellarossa.com is the website. Check it out. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for your time, Sophie. Thank you, Ashley. Next up, I had a chat with Philip Ravy, who, amongst other things, is the creative director of Film Bath. Hello, 
Philip. Hello, Ashley. How are you? I'm absolutely hunky dory, thank you. Excellent. Um, so we are sort of talking about the the last year, the strange year that it's been 2020 leading into 2021, um, and what it's kind of brought for everyone. So how has it been for you? I think with a few exceptions, which I can say more about, it's been absolutely fine. It hasn't been inconvenient. I haven't been ill. I haven't lost anyone I love. Um, I've had lots of nice company in the house. Um, life has gone on in a very peaceful, easy kind of way. The main drawback has been not seeing my family, you know, my children, grandchildren. Um, but apart from that, it's been very good. Yeah, you were lucky enough to meet your latest grandchild. We met Oshina a week ago today, who's now three months old. Big and bonny. Yeah. That was delightful, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously you don't form a deep, sort of intimate relationship at three months old, but but it's lovely to see him, and um, I hope I'll have many more years watching him grow up. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of people this year who've missed out on um, seeing family. I know I missed out on uh, the, most of the first year of my niece mm -hmm. um, being in the world, but um, like you are saying, there's, there's lots of people who've had much worse. Um, Certainly so have. A lot to be grateful for. Um I wanted to talk to you a bit about the film festival. Yep. So Film Bath. Film Bath. Formerly known as the Bath Film Festival. Well, it's slightly... The Film Bath is an umbrella name for everything that goes on. The festival is the actual event that takes place in November. Film Bath is the organisation which includes the IMDb um, Script Screen Award, the IMD Short Film Award and the F Rating. So in a way, the festival is a subsection of Film Bath. Right. Okay. Just to be clear. Fair enough. Um, so this past year for films and film enthusiasts has been somewhat strange because nobody's been allowed to go into the cinema. And how do you put on a film festival if you can't go into a cinema? Well, we were quite imaginative, so we managed to do two things at the end of last year. One is to put on a joint online festival with Cambridge, Brighton and Cornwall. So four of the bigger regional film festivals collaborated to put on an online festival in November of about 40 films over two weeks. And it was it was successful enough. It wasn't groundbreaking. We didn't make a thing we want to do it again, but it did. It washed its face and enough people enjoyed it. And we kind of reached beyond our normal audience. And then on top of that in December got postponed because of the changes in lockdown. We took over Green Park Station for five nights and showed uh, nine or ten films over those five nights, one of which is up for BAFTAs and Oscars called Nomadland. And we did that with a big blow-up screen and a DCP projector, which basically means the same projector used in cinemas. And everyone had radio headsets and they're all socially distanced. They were cold because it was December. Um, but we did warn people about that. And then there was also food outlets nearby. So everyone had a really good time. And, when, and at the trustees meeting yesterday, we were talking about doing it again this year. Because who knows what will happen with cinemas when they reopen, whether people are going to want to go or not. Um, and the Green Park idea kind of works both ways because it's kind of outdoors, kind of socially distanced. But you're undercover, you've got a big screen, you've got a big screen experience and you're with other people. That uh, is imaginative and making the best of a very tricky situation. It is. Um, you touched on a couple of things um, in the film bar from Bella, if you like, outside of the film festival that would be interesting to talk about. Um, the IMDb Script to Screen Awards. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, IMDb is the biggest film website in the world, stands for the Internet Movie Database. It was founded just over 30 years ago by a guy called Col Needham, who lives in Bristol. And it was in the dawn of the internet, so... Hard though it is to believe, he used to watch every film that he watched and then type out the credits at the end, literally type them out. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the internet came along, so he was able to start putting it online, and he made a success out of it. And probably nearly 25 years ago now, he sold it to Amazon, but kept running it. And about eight, nine years ago, Holly and I, my colleague at the festival, realized that IMDb was based in Bristol. We always thought it was a huge American company, but no, there was this guy in Bristol who was still running it. So we got in touch with him, and we met to meet him, and we got on very well. And ever since then, he's supported two of our uh, things that we do, one of which is to, for people to write a short film script, 
and then the finalists get performed on stage and the winner gets £5,000 and equipment to make a film which we show at the festival. So that's a way of getting, hopefully, but mostly young people to develop their script writing and directing skills. Excellent. And then we also have a competition where people uh, send in short films, no more than 10 minutes long, and I watch them all just as I <laughs> read every script that's submitted and we again shortlist them and uh, we have a, a, a final with judges during the festival and then the winner gets a thousand pounds uh, and as Cole likes to say they get an IMDb pin badge which very very hard to come by <laughs> I don't have one so and did you manage to run that competition that both those things this uh did we run those last year we showed no we didn't we showed some short films, but we didn't have the competition. God, I can't remember now. It's painful, isn't it? Um, no, I don't think we did. But we will do it again this year. Excellent. So then the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is is the F rating. Yeah. So you're one of the creative directors of the film festival. I'm the creative director because Holly is the executive director, which is not to say that she doesn't do far more work than I do. But those are our titles. She's a full-time paid employee. I'm a part-time unpaid employee. Right. If you can be an employee if you're not paid. Um, so she's in charge of running the whole festival and I'm in charge of the programming. So she's the one who came up with the idea of F rating. So um, there was a famous cartoon many years ago called the Bechdel Test in which two women are walking down the road and the idea is that, that if they took any film in which... Uh, two women are together not talking about men passes the Bechdel test. So the idea is that women in film are relegated to sort of supporting roles. Right. So Holly modified that to the idea that an F rating, which is sort of changed, but essentially now is any films directed by women. And so in the if you take the whole of films that are made in any given year, the percentage is somewhere around sort of four or five percent. Directed by women. Directed by women. It's, it's sort of slowly increasing, but that was the kind of starting figure. And so the idea is to promote the fact that so few films are directed by women by applying an F rating to any film that is directed by a woman and then sort of putting our money where our mouth is by saying that 50% or more of our programme will be F rated and then promoting that in other areas, obviously in other film festivals, in cinemas, but in other, other cultural things. So emphasising you know, the participation of women and the fact that it's relatively rare, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's been... Um, I might say interesting, but not not in a good way. Ty, um, like the past few years, <clears throat> the film industry um, and women within it, there's been a lot of things highlighted that have that's people who perhaps were have never made films weren't aware of, but were quite aware, quite well known within the industry. So the the major first thing was that is the Me Too movement that came through from. Um, uh, uh, horrific stuff that was going on with, with Harvey Weinstein and then seemed to be quite widespread within the industry um, where um, it was it was basically exploitation of young women who were looking to get into the industry. Uh, <clears throat> and then more recently, something that's perhaps a little bit less well-known but I think it's quite significant, is um, the introduction of specific people when a film is being made to kind of choreograph um, intimate scenes and make sure yep. that everyone is yep. comfortable. comfortable. Yep. <clears throat> um, so it seems as though the film industry um, is taking a kind of long, hard look at itself in respect to um, women, um, which is good. Um, but as you say, there's still a long way to go because only a small amount of films directed by women are making it to the uh, the big screen. So... What I'd like to sort of get from you is what do you think, um, it, it, is there anything different or what do you think is gained from a kind of creative perspective from having more films directed by women? Well, the, the, the core, if I, if I talk about the film festival, our kind of core vision, mission, whatever you want to call it, is diversity. So as many voices from as many different parts of culture, from whatever gender people are, whatever sexuality they are, whatever country they come from, we're, we're amplifying diversity. If that's not too much of a slogan. Now, we happen to focus particularly on women because they represent slightly more than half the human race and they are very underrepresented in cinema. But in general, we are looking for more diverse voices, and obviously that includes you know, non-white 
films made by non-white people and from different countries around the world. And we've always prided ourselves on a program that comes from a very broad spectrum of places. I think the film industry in, let's say, the Hollywood film industry and to some extent the British film industry, which is a kind of a offshore uh, base, is very conservative. It, it, uh, we were talking about it yesterday in terms of programming. So there are lots of young people want to get into programming and into jobs in the film industry, but, but no one ever moves. If you look at, for example, film critics, the same film critic work for year after year after year after year. If you're in any job in the film industry, it's a kind of static job and you hang on to it. Mm. So there isn't any throughput. So people tend to cling on to what they've got and they are predominantly white male. Right. And... There's a change. So the BAFTAs, which I think are on very soon, uh, there's at least three women directors who are represented. But that's like a revolution, the fact that's happened. Right. Uh, and there are more black actors represented at the Oscars, but everyone's making, oh, isn't this amazing? But it's a one-off. You know, yeah. it, it, it's like people tend to make these gestures and then think, well, well let's, let's get rewarded for being so virtuous. But I think the change needs to take place at a much deeper level whereby... People aren't basing their decisions on gender or colour uh, and realise that it's talent that counts. I mean, there have been some fantastic films. I mean, I I think Moonlight is a wonderful film, which is made by Barry Jenkins, who's black. Um, But it's more the the opportunities that are given to people and white male directors tend to get more and more opportunities, whether or not they fail. uh, And women directors often get one chance, and then if it doesn't work out, then they're dumped. Right, right. Because you, I would expect there would be, to a degree, some something new brought to the the scene. I suppose in 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 the terms of, if you think about um, the male gaze, um, and most of film directors being male, mm-hmm. then you're going to get a lot of that in film. Um, I know you're not a fan, but one person who always springs to mind when I think about this is Quentin Tarantino and his fetish with um, women's feet. And if you ever watch any of his films, then there's so many women's feet in it. It's quite crazy um i think i think the problem with tarantino i think he's a really talented director in terms of individual scenes you know you take any given scene you could probably make this scene into fun he could film what we're doing now and make it really interesting but as a whole thing his films are there's something deeply wrong with them there's a lot of (laughs) you know i mean once upon time in hollywood was just a really disturbing film i thought what you know what are you doing um anyway sorry but yeah no i was just um what what i guess i'm trying to trying to get from and it might not be that there is because obviously women are directing films in all sorts of different genres but I just wondered if there was anything that you've noticed that women seem to bring to a film in a creative way that that men are missing or that is different or well I, I, I think that's a good question but equally I think one thing I'd respond to it is Holly always says women should be allowed to make as many bad films as men are yeah. You know, so there's this sense in which, well, we're getting women a chance to make films, but if they're not good, obviously, we won't work with them anymore. But that doesn't count for men. So it's like the point is to have completely equal opportunity. If someone makes a bad film, it's a bad film. It's not because they're a man or a woman. Mm. Um, I think there have been some significant things. I think the success of Wonder Woman was a big breakthrough. Patty Jenkins directed that and they just made a sequel. The same with Black Panther having a black director. So if you get these big budget, you know, multi, multi billion. Uh, dollar films directed by someone who's not male or white, then people do to some extent sit up and take notice. Um, the other film that I that we showed in um, Green Park, which is up for all these awards, is Nomadland, played by uh, directed by Chloe Zhao, and um, not commercial at all, but every, you know it had really good reviews. But the trouble is that you then focus on them, and and there's a sort of suspicion that if somebody doesn't make a good film, then there's something wrong with them because they're a woman rather than. Yeah. They just make a film. It doesn't matter what sex they are. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, I mean, that's the dream. So I think the, da- the danger in saying to women, obviously women do have a different perspective, but equally different men have different perspectives to each other and different women have different perspectives yeah. to each other. Yeah. So, you know, you take someone like, um, God, what's the woman who made Zero Dark Thirty uh, uh, and films like that, who's, you know, it's action films. Right. And then you get Chloe Zhao making Nomadland, which is not an action film. So they, they do vary quite a lot. yeah. Okay, I, I get that. And I, I think you're absolutely right that the the key is equality of opportunity. Um, yeah, rather than sort of um, putting focus on, on which individuals. Um, that was great. Thanks for having a chat about that. Um, I appreciate the fact that we're uh, both two white men talking about diversity in film. Um, but I feel to say uh, 
you've got a lot to say about it because you've uh, spent a lot of time watching. Well, I feel I've sort of channeled my inner Holly. Holly is very feminist and I was probably a bit feminist before I met her, but now I'm kind of, I can't really think about film without seeing things through her eyes. So uh, (laughs) it's not that I feel female, but I do feel that I do look at things differently than I used to before I worked with her. And that whenever I watch a film, I'm really thinking about a how women are being presented, and and b how they're you know being viewed by the audience, because um, it's it's just very striking when you think about it. It's often you think, well, why are they doing that? Why are they showing that particular scene? Why is she taking her clothes off? You know, yeah, whatever it may be. So you do watch films with a different eye once you think about it in terms of uh, the representation of women. Yeah, yeah, I think it's. Um I think there's a lot of that going on, not just in in watching films, but in in society in general. Now, I think there's um, it's been highlighted to men in general that that um, there's a there's a very different perspective for women in lots of ways, and I think it's good that 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 reflection. I, I give you a, a sort of example. So last night we watched a film called I Care a Lot, which has got Rosamund Pike as the main actress, and she's in a lesbian relationship with another woman, and it reminded me in some ways of a film about 25 years ago called Bound made by the Wachowskis before they made The Matrix, which is also about two, two lesbian women who are kind of in a similar plot. And that film, it goes out of its way to have a very erotic scene between them, which is clearly nothing to do with the film at all, but was for commercial reasons. In last night's film, not, I'm saying it's not a better or film, but there was none of that at all. They, you know, they kissed a bit, but it wasn't like we're going to make the female lesbian eroticism part of the entertainment. So to me, that's a kind of significant shift that you take away. Oh, we're showing lesbians. We're really, we're really radical, but actually, you're showing them naked, making love with each other, which is voyeuristic. So, right. If you move away from that, is a, you know, it's a change. Yeah. For the yeah. better. I yeah okay cool I appreciate that. Um, so we are getting a little bit on in time. I would like you to recommend to our audience some good films that have come out maybe in the last year. Well, Nomadland slightly doesn't count because although we've shown it at the festival, it hasn't been released, but I would urge everyone to go and see it when they can. Um, I mean, this is going back a couple of years. One of my favourite films the last two years has been Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which is a French film, which we showed in 2019, I think. Absolutely. It's one of those films I watched and I thought it's a perfect film. There's nothing, and I don't do this very often, there was nothing I would change about it. And I watched it again and I had the same experience. Um, and what are these two about Nomadland and Portrait of Lady on Fire is a lesbian love story uh, about two French women in the late 18th century one of them is a painter and the other is the model and I won't go into the whole plot but it's it's an almost entirely male free film there's a you know the crew everyone who made the film is a woman everyone in the film is a woman so it's just a woman's perspective on on that relationship um, Nomadland's about a woman who's lost her home, her husband died, she has not enough money, so she buys an SUV, one of those big sort of vans, and travels around America, you know, meeting other people in the same position um, from a very unglamorized, unromanticized point of view. And, and nearly everybody in the film, apart from Frances McDormand, who plays the main character, are people who live that life already. Uh, okay. So they're not actors, they are people playing themselves so it has a almost like a documentary feel about it although it's not a documentary it's a remarkable film it's very very unusual and then another one which is coming out soon is called supernova with colin firth and stanley tucci as a gay couple um who are going on a road trip together because stanley tucci is suffering from early onset dementia um but there's, I mean, the, the thing is, there are a lot of good films on netflix at the moment and I, on amazon prime there's one called one night in miami um, about a meeting between Cassius Clay before he became Muhammad Ali yes, and Jim Brown and uh, Sam Cooke and Malcolm X. And I thought it was a really interesting film. I thought the Mangrove, Steve McQueen Mangrove film was remarkable. That was really good, um, yeah. So there are lots of good films on online or on streaming services, but it's like, what will happen when cinema's open again? Yeah, that's... Will the James Bond be enough to get people back to the cinema? Or if they go once, will they go back after that? So it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, we'll see what happens. We have, there's no sort of time scale on that at the moment either, is there? Um, I think it'll be May, probably. I think most things are open by May. Um, okay. It's just who knows. If people, are, if people have got a free, are they going to think, oh, I can't wait to go to the cinema, or are they going to be doing lots of other things? 
We shall see. We shall see. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time, Philip. It's been a pleasure. Chat. Thank you for talking to me. Yeah, thank you. We've come now to the final interview for this podcast, where I speak to Jenny McCune about her work and how she adapted to working completely remotely for the first time in her career. Hello, Jenny. Hi, Ashley. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Excellent. So, uh, here we are. We are just over a year since um, coronavirus pandemic restrictions hit us in the UK. Um, How's it been for you? Well, it's amazing when you mention that it's a year since that happened. I remember it very, very clearly because it was a dramatic moment. I have been um, working as a trainer, working with groups of people, and I either go to other places like a Schumacher College or um, something called Catalyst 14, or I run the training groups here, and I actually run more training groups here than going elsewhere. And we, I was running a group here on March the 12th, yeah, just which I remember very clear, because it ended, I think, on March the 12th, and lockdown hadn't happened then, but it was going to happen within 10 days. And the whole world, I remember coming back from Paddington Station and it being extraordinarily quiet. And it was obvious that the world was going to change in a, in a totally unprecedented way. And my initial thought was, oh, well, that's the end of my work, working life. You know, I, the thing I do, which is training people in the live, has stopped. Mm. Um, and I felt that for about 10 days. And then one morning I woke up and I thought, oh, no, oh, of course not, no. I just have to learn how to do it differently. Um, so I decided to do that. I didn't want to go online and sort of do just some basic common denominator. I wanted to learn how to do it in a way that was engaging and vital. So I took several weeks, probably about four or five weeks, and I um, approached everybody I knew who was good at working online um, and several people, I just asked them if they'd give me a one-to-one session telling me what, how to do it. And people were very kind at that point. I think the whole drama of the pandemic was sort of new and people really wanted to help each other. And I was very sincere in wanting to learn. But I also attended um, some actual seminars about how to work well online. And um, one was with a, uh, somebody I knew well, but who lives in New Zealand, called Katie Grenier. Um, And she was brilliant. We only had an hour session with her. But everything she talked about, she did there and then. And she had a brilliant technical facilitator. And for me, I'd never imagined how good it could be online. Right. Uh, And I laughed and I had a good time and I went into breakout rooms and I met people who I remember now, (laughs) a whole year later, from all around the world. Um, and I also went to a similar seminar with somebody called Manesh, um, who I know through the social presencing theatre work that I do. Um, and again, it was amusing, it was engaging, and within an hour and a quarter, he taught us a huge amount of what to do. Right. So it was great. Um, and I suppose I've really enjoyed that part. I love learning, so you know, I was pushed into learning. And um, after about six weeks of learning... Um, I ran my first online training program and the people were so pleased with it. They said they had no idea how entrancing online work (laughs) could be. I thought, oh, entrancing. I never expected to (laughs) entrance people. Uh, So it was really worth the investment. Now, I don't mean to say it's all been fun. It's obviously been very challenging, the time online. Mm. At the time, sorry, not uh, online, the the time of lockdown. Mm. Um, I think I found it very strange to begin with that I couldn't see friends and very strange that I couldn't see family. Mm -hmm. Um, And we did have a long spell in the summer when it wasn't like that. We did actually see friends and family and we went on short holidays. Yeah. But I think everybody's, because we've now had another big lockdown, everybody thinks of the whole year as lockdown, really. Yeah, it's definitely been, um, it's like waves of... um, Times when it's felt sort of uh, quite overbearing and then times where it's felt 
less overbearing. Um, and I think, you know, everyone's experienced it, it differently. Um, just, I just want to talk about your work because your work specifically um, would appear to be challenging to do online. Yeah. Because the work that you do now, you've done lots of things in your life, but the way, way you focus yourself now is, is on um, embodied coaching. Yeah. Um, and so just give us a bit of a, 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 like an overview of, of what, what we mean by, by that, by embodied coaching, by the embodied experience. Well, I certainly would be happy to do that. Um, I can't really describe it without also saying something about the whole concept of knowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because um, th- there are four primary ways of knowing. One is intuitive knowing. One is emotional knowing or emotional intelligence with the heart. And one is embodied knowing. And the most well-known one is cognitive or intellectual knowing. Yeah. Um, and most people think that you learn through your cognition, through your intellect. And I think that's really how we are taught to think about knowing when we're, ch- when we're young people. Children themselves, you know, actually in primary school, they learn through all the ways of knowing. Mm-hmm. Um, but once you go to secondary school, there's a tremendous emphasis on cognitive um, intellectual knowing. Yeah. Um, so you have to learn things, cognitive facts, and you have to regurgitate them for exams. Yeah. And yeah. you and I have talked about that sometimes. You know, that there's nothing wrong with that way of knowing, but it's not the most fun way of knowing, and it's definitely not the only way of knowing. No, I think when we look at the others, so we'll get on to embodied knowing in a second, but mm. just briefly on um, intuitive knowing, um, I think that carries through... Um, we that we it's not that rare to talk about tr- intuition and, and sort of intuitive knowing is something that perhaps people are less confident with, but still, um, you know, you, you can have an intuition about something, mm. and and of course, emotional knowing where you you know how you feel about things, definitely, and that's just that's impossible to ignore, so. and that's a guide often to what we do in life is our emotional knowing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, now I've already actually mentioned a, a little intuitive moment that I had when I woke up that morning and thought, no, I don't stop working, I just learn how to do it differently. Yeah. That was one of those <laughs> flashes, you know, it was different, totally different the way I've been thinking for 10 days. Yeah. And it just came on me that, that I would be able to learn differently. Yeah. Whereas somehow I'd, I'd assumed I couldn't. And do you think that was your cognitive, because you thought, looked at the challenges that presented itself with... Mm. Um, Mm. with learning to do everything online mm. you'd sort of talk to yourself how of the I think so and perhaps even nobody actually said to me I couldn't do it but if I had asked some of my my kids or something they probably would have said just leave it <laughs> <laughs> and they've been fantastic once they found that I had gone online and I was making a big success of it they did actually say to me oh respect mum because <laughs> I think they hadn't expected me to any more than I did so that was a little bit of intuitive knowing and when I um, talk to people teach people about these different ways of knowing I'll actually often ask a group how many of you have made a major decision in your life about leaving work or leaving a relationship or about engaging in work or engaging in a relationship based on intuition and um I mean, it's very rare for not 90% of the people to put their hands up. Mm. At some point, they've made a major decision based on intuition. Even scientists and all the people who think they're super, super rational. <laughs> <laughs> so those are, th- those are three ways of knowing that, that people are um, probably quite familiar with. Now, embodied, the embodied knowing. Well, embodied knowing, um, I agree, I think it's less well known. Um, because we're sort of trained out of attending to our body when we're young. We're trained out of attending to our body and into attending to our head. Um, But actually, our bodies pick up a lot. They're like registers. They pick up a lot of um, sort of the energy around, the interactions which are going on between people, uh, the body language of another person that you're engaged in. Um, So it's a pity to screen out embodied knowing. There's a great deal of knowledge in it which is really useful if you want to read the room 
or if you want to read a situation and make wise suggestions yeah. or take wise actions. Um, and once people start attending to their bodies, they do find that. They find that it's a really useful instrument. And I'm not against cognitive knowing at all, but I just want people to add in their embodied, intuitive um, and emotional knowing as well because yeah. they, they feel so much fuller when they do. I think perhaps we're almost more aware of other people's body language than we are of our own often. So yes, that might be true. Yes. And so a lot of, when you say sort of attending to your body, I think there's a lot of, um, we don't know it's how we sit and how we, how, and once, because I've done a bit of this work with you, and actually once you start paying attention to it, um, you do start to notice how your body reacts yes. to certain situations um, that you just, I've just never really paid much attention to no. before. I, I also think it's really interesting the way science has evolved over the, over the last 10 or 20 years, really, because they've discovered that um, we have brains, we have cells in our heart, which are like the cells in our heart, in our heads, mm. which is extraordinary. Yeah, and yeah. I was going up, we didn't know that. And that's, of course, emotional knowing. So we do actually have cells like our brain cells in our heart. <laughs> so it's not a fabrication, it is an actual truth. We've got cells which can process knowledge in our, in our hearts. And we've also got cells in our guts which resemble the cells in our head, in our brains. Right. So again, we've actually got cells that can process knowing within our bodies. So it's... Um, you know, it's interesting the way science and neuroscience is constantly supporting these ideas yeah. as they discover more. Yeah, I think it's interesting because in your career as a whole, you, from what I can gather, you tend to have um, taken on board things, um, which some of which have later on become more mainstream. So when yes. you were younger, mm. you did a lot of work with um, psychotherapy yeah um before that was as mainstream as what it is now yeah um, and certainly with um you were kind of well on board with the ecological movement when people were still mm. sort of um discovering about that do you think um that that's really true i mean i worked for friends of the earth uh before i had any children yeah so 35 40 years ago yeah when it was much more peculiar to be an environmentalist than it is now I'm glad to say everybody is becoming an environmentalist now. Isn't that wonderful? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's and I, I also think that the embodied thing, more people are getting interested in it. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Do you think that's going to become more... Um... Well, they had a big conference on embodiment in this last October. And it was online, so it obviously could attract huge numbers of people. And people from all sorts of disciplines talked there. So there were people who did um, the sort of work that I do, which involves embodied systemic mapping yeah. or constellations and four-dimensional mapping. But there are also people who did trauma work. So Bezel van der Kolk, who's extremely well-known in trauma, he was there. So there were really people coming from all different disciplines as well as all over the world. And people were really excited by it. Um, and I belong in a group of people who are learning about trauma release. Um, and we were allowed to buy the recordings of that conference for something like $80 right. and share the cost between us. So I paid less than £20 to have access to those recordings. Now, that really makes something accessible. Mm. I mean, that was really impressive, I thought, that they did that. Yeah, yeah. So with the embodied um, work that you do, like you were saying, oh, yeah. up until the, the pandemic hit and the restrictions on movement and, and all that came in, um, it was always done in person. Um, and it was a big step to do it online. Yeah. Um, because it's very physical. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's all about your whole body and it's not just about talking. So... How did you manage to um, address that? Well, again, I'm keen on learning. So I did go around saying to people, how are you doing this? Yeah. Can you show me what you're doing? 
I'm never, um, I'm not too proud to do that. You know, I know lots of people who wouldn't do it, but I just am very, very keen to learn. Um, so I had several people who showed me what they were inventing, um, which gave me more confidence to try it myself. And I've gone on using things they've recommended. And of course, I've developed my own ways. And one of the things that we've discovered once we had the courage to go online is that people seem to have an embodied sense of each other, even when they're a long way away. So even when they're 100 miles away or even 1,000 miles away. Right. They don't just rely... People assume that you rely on that little tiny picture that you get on Zoom, mm -hmm. the visual way of seeing each other. Mm -hmm. But in fact, people seem to have uh, a, a sensory connection with each other, even over that sort of distance. Um, so that when we're doing this work online, we can rely on the visual element, we can re rely on the hearing element, mm -hmm. and we can rely on an embodied sensation as well, a kinesthetic sensation. Right. So we've got three of our um, five senses much more available than we thought we had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I and others thought that we would only have vision and hearing. Whereas we seem to have an embodied sensation as well, or a kinesthetic connection, which obviously makes it very much better. As far as I know, people don't have a... <laughs> they can't smell things. A smell one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that embodied sensation that people get when they're working with somebody else or with a group of people miles away is, is very valuable. Because mm. uh, I have done it, and I've seen other people do it with their eyes semi closed you know they're not giving nearly as much attention to the visual as you would think they're giving a great deal of attention to the sense of embodied kinesthetic connection that's fascinating isn't it? it is really fascinating and that wasn't something i expected so i didn't bring my expectation into the situation at all and when i first noticed it i didn't tell people because i became really interested to know whether or not people would report that even if they haven't been influenced by other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have reported it very, very, um, pretty much every group I've worked with. Right. And I, this year I've probably, we've had 12 months, haven't we? I've probably done as much as six to ten days working with people a month. Right. So I've done a huge amount of working with people online, doing maps and embodied pictures of the systems in which they belong yeah do you think that this is going to sort of affect the way that you work going forward um are you looking forward to having groups back in the house or are you going to carry on doing online do you think of a mixture of both how do you think do you know it's almost not quite but it's almost as unknown as it was last year march the 12th year yeah, ago. yeah um I have really enjoyed this year, much, much more than I would have expected. I've often put groups of English and French people together or groups of European people and Asian people together for several days. And so they really get to know each other and something about each other's cultures and lives and so on. Mm. And I've enjoyed that, but they have enjoyed it very much as well. Um, so I think m mo a lot of people speak about everything we lose by being online. But I actually think we gain some things too. And the real cross-cultural knowing is part of it. The other thing it makes us be is much more precise. We have to be really precise with time and a bit more precise with design. Because when I'm working with people live, I rely on my intuition and on the body language of the people. And I do have a design always, but I let it unfold more. Whereas online, I think you have to be quite reasonably clear about what you're doing all the time or you lose people right right right. right. what do you think because you do a lot online as well yeah i mean i the stuff i do online with work is a little bit it works very different it's, it's a lot of more of a sort of either formal or informal meetings yes. um i have sort of um facilitated a few meetings but um i don't i yeah i how do i find it I don't find it. I in in terms of meeting, I I prefer to be in a room with people. I feel like um, with with my work, um, 
sometimes people are doing other things whilst they're in the meeting because you can when you're on Zoom, you can be answering yeah. emails and things like that. Whereas I like it when everyone's focused. I think you get a better meeting and a better outcome. But I've not done anything like you have. I haven't done any teaching or any um, like facilitating activities. It's just been more mm. small kind of meetings. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to being able to to do things in person again. But I think... Um, a lot of things will stay online. I think, yeah, you know, there's there's some definite advantages to it. I mean, commuting is not good for the, it's not good for the environment. It's not good for the traffic on the roads. It's not good for um, it's not good to be stuck in traffic, is it? So I yeah. think it'll, there'll be a reduction in that, which will be good. But I, I, w- I wouldn't want everything to go online. No, I mean, when I used to do the training groups here, they were residential. Um, and we did have a really good time. We would make a, a sort of collective meal in the evening, and on the might have two or three evenings together. It was almost felt like Christmas time or something. You know, people <laughs> really had a good time. I had a good time. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we don't get that. No. Um, online. So I think that some people will be keen to get together for some of that. But for me, it's definitely been better not travelling so much. Yeah, yeah. I feel more sort of grounded and settled. Um, so I, I wouldn't really like to predict, but I imagine that as much as 50% will go back to being in person eventually, but I don't know how long that will be. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for your time, Jenny. It's been wonderful. You're very welcome. <laughs> That's been wonderful. You're very good at this, Ashley. Thank you. <laughs> So there we have it. We've come to the end of the South Stoke House Lockdown podcast. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to share a few of my own reflections, really, um, listening back to that. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, um, this introduction and the, these, the bits that I've done between the interviews have been recorded uh, a year after the original interviews were were done there's there's a number of reasons for that and and partly it's because um shortly after we recorded them um as things started to open up again uh things really started to speed up and i and ollie had to go back to work and was really busy and then before we knew it ollie and sophie had left the house and decided they they'd gone off traveling in their van which which was always their plan the the van that lockdown built so to speak um and i think really that's that 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 was a defining feature of the lockdowns or the the restriction times was time felt elastic in a way um there were times where it felt it was going really slowly and the pace of life in the whole country and the well, around the world i really I suppose um, I slowed right down and, you know, people would the chance to um, appreciate the, the little things in life more and people were less busy and then things would open up and people would be have to go back to work and all of a sudden the world would just start spinning again at the same speed that it was before. And it, I think those things were... I think that was probably some of the hardest stuff to deal with in hindsight. It's been um, change and the speed of change and the the sort of uncertainty um, throughout it all. I mean, there's been the uncertainty around the uh, the obvious stuff in a pandemic where we know everyone's been uncertain about you know our our family and friends. Are are we personally going to contract uh the coronavirus and what will that mean because for different people it's had different effects some people um have come through it relatively unscathed some people have been completely asymptomatic and 
of course, at the other end of the scale, tragically, thousands and thousands of people have have died from it. Um, and that uncertainty has always been tricky to deal with, along with, you know, what if I get it and what what happens if I don't realise I've got it and I give it to people that I know and care about or even people that I don't know, you know, nobody wants to feel that burden of responsibility of feeling that you know perhaps we've acted irresponsibly in some way and and um accidentally passed it on to someone vulnerable um and we've all had to deal with with that um but also the uncertainty around what will emerge from the other side of the pandemic um you know what things are going to what what things out of the changes that have occurred have, are going to stick around, what we're going to be left with, um, and what, what things will go back to the way they were before. There was a lots of conversation around this over, over the, the years, really, that, that we spent going through this. Um, I talk about this all in the past tense because we were still uncertain, really, as to whether something else might happen with it, whether a new variant might emerge that causes the whole situation to re re erupt. It feels like at the moment as though we've um got got past the worst of it. There's um effective vaccines have been rolled out, um people have been protected and more recently in the the last sort of wave of, of coronavirus, the the variant known as Omicron has certainly been a lot more mild than the previous uh variants that have that have caused caused a lot more um suffering and death and it feels now as though it's something that, that we we're, we're gonna live with going forward. And so we can be hopeful about that. Um, but yeah, it's been a listening back to those interviews uh, from a year ago has sort of just brought back to me really um, how 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 much it was affecting us all. I mean, I, I noticed when I was listening back to them that that my like my idea behind doing this podcast was to focus on sort of the I suppose some of the more constructive things that have happened the more um in a way positive things that have come out of it and and I was I noticed listening back to it a few times I sort of brought to an end um little parts of conversations where perhaps it was going in a in a slightly different direction and and we didn't always explore um how how we'd felt about the more difficult parts of it. Uh, it wasn't a conscious decision really to do that, but I think reflecting back, it was probably just a bit more about how I was feeling at the time and how um didn't really want to keep talking about those things because we'd been talking about them with, you know, everyone had been talking about them for for a year and the feeling was it's to kind of get past that aspect of it and start um, start looking at sort of kind of the more positive things that have come out of it. Um, I think now, um, I, it, it, listening back, it feels like that was a long, long time ago. Um, it was, it was, it was a year. It wasn't a huge amount of time ago. Um, but it was a strange year. Um, I think it's been, I think there's a general consensus in the country that our government didn't deal with it well. Um, we had a, a prime minister who didn't step up to the mark and didn't really, um, take on board the responsibility that was in his hands. Um, I mean, it's no secret to people who know me that I've never really been the world's biggest Boris Johnson fan, but like everybody 
when the pandemic happened, it was I was willing to give them, give the government and Boris Johnson a, a lot of leeway because it was an unprecedented time, and that you know we were expected things to. You can't expect people to get to get that right the first time, but I, I really think that um, what we've learned since about what was going on behind the scenes, and certainly with regards to some of the um, the rules and things that were put in place, and the the lack of acknowledgement of of what the the chief medical officer and the chief science officer were giving the government in terms of guidance um led to some really really tragic outcomes not to mention huge huge waste of billions of pounds of public money as the government decided to um sort of give contracts to not to the people or the or the companies that that were best suited to supporting the country through this, but but actually to their friends and their business associates and and people who were close to them, um, and so we've we've had to deal with on part of the the thing that's made the whole thing difficult has been knowing really that we've been led by a, an incompetent government throughout it. Um, and it's it's um yeah like i say it's some very very tragic outcomes and it's, it's led to from from like jenny mentioned like at the beginning of the the pandemic people were very sort of kind to each other and very open to sharing and and one of the things that was really heartening was how people tend to people a lot of things emerged at the beginning of the pandemic in terms of a sense of community. People turned to each other for support and they turned to the communities that they lived in and looked at the most vulnerable people. And lots of people went out of their way to sort of help each other and to help people who were vulnerable. There were lots of... Um, like support group coronavirus support groups that sprung up across the country kind of um sporadically where people were you know going doing shopping for people that had to stay at home all the time because they were vulnerable and uh providing telephone befriending services and all sorts of things um you know in our little village someone set up a little shop where we could get some of the supplies that were more difficult to get in in the supermarket and um there was the village quiz that happened every fortnight online so people in the village could spend a couple of hours <laughs> battling out over the quiz um which was fun and and of course there was the the clapping for the nhs which happened for the, at the beginning of the pandemic happened for i don't know a couple of months every thursday i think it was or was it tuesday where everyone went outside on the doorstep and at eight o'clock and cheered into the into the sky in for the NHS workers people were banging pans and and it was just a big way of everyone saying thank you to the NHS and the people who were working in it for all of the the hard work that that they were doing um it was really really heartening and um unfortunately because of various things but not least because of um the way the government dealt with with it that 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 became fractured and certainly in the last year particularly there's been a rise of um quite a division like a, a minority of of the population but a vocal minority of sort of a sort of hodgepodge really of people who are skeptical to some degree whether it's skeptical of the government's um motives or skeptical of um the motives of the pharmaceutical companies that are producing the vaccines all the way to people that were um 
people that are still really skeptical of the the pandemic as a whole um and have sort of gone down a rabbit hole of conspiracy theories um about different things that probably aren't worth mentioning um and it's 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 become really challenging to have conversations about that kind of thing um fortunately now we're coming through the other side of it and the restrictions have been lifted and hopefully we can put all of of that stuff behind us um but it's been really really tricky um and i think as well one of the other things i think looking back at this is that missed the opportunity to record a few more interviews with other people who live at the house which would have which would have been really um which i think would have really added to the uh the podcast as a whole we've got um for example we have someone who lives at the house who was working on the front line at the on the covid wards at the local hospital um who i really would uh, have liked to have interviewed but like i say once we sort of finished recording them um things started moving really really quickly and before we knew it it was people were busy again and um it, it it finished as it did and i i listening back to it I, you know it's enjoyable listening to it and um and i think it's probably more poignant than what i imagined it would be um just because it was a very strange time in history um and i think it's for me it's it's caught a a little snapshot of um of that time and i'm happy to have been able to share it with you all um so yeah that's my little thoughts having listened back to it and um i hope you enjoy listening to it So a massive thank you to everyone who took part in the South Stoke House Lockdown Podcast. Alison Hallett, Sophie Smith, Philip Ravy, Jenny McCune. Thanks for your time and your insights. And a massive thank you to Ollie Middleton for doing all the recording and for the jingles. My name's Ashley Crapp. I hope you enjoyed the show. Bye for now. Um, we had a bit of a chat before and there is a, an activity that our listeners can try at home Oh yeah. that um, <laughs> might introduce them a little bit into um, the world of embodiment. Um, Are we actually going to broadcast this? I thought it was all private. <laughs> <laughs> well, our listeners may only be our friends and family, but they're still out there. They might be doing it in their homes. So... Um, do you want to run us through the, the stuck activity? I would be happy to. Um, and it's one of the many things I've learned initially from other people. Um, I did a, I've done lots and lots of different training things in my life. And about three years ago, I did something called social presencing theatre. Um, and that's a dance and movement practice, which was founded by somebody called Arawana Hayashi, who is... Um, as she sounds, she's of Japanese origin, but she's American. Um, so I suppose she's Japanese-American. And she has made a partnership with Otto Sharma, who's um, the founder of the Presencing Institute. And um, they're really, really interconnected and intermeshed. And she trained us in all sorts of movement, sculpting, um, dances, and I loved it the moment I got to do it with her. <laughs> uh, and I signed up for the advanced training programme, which I went to Berlin for a year, four times for seven days. And I'd, I'd be going back now if there was another programme to do. <laughs> um, so she taught us all sorts of things. And this thing called the stuck activity is just one of them. But it's quite central to the social presencing theatre in the sense that um, it's one small activity but other activities are based on it and sort of become extensions of it. Right, right, right. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to 
share that with you now. Okay. And and if you choose to do it, then it's good to actually acknowledge where it came from because well, it is something very specific. Is, is it going to take part in the stack activity? Oh, we'll see, that would be good. Yeah. Are we all going to do it at once? Yeah. What about you? you he, can can do it do it own, he can do it in his own time. Yeah. When he listens back to this. Oh, sorry, I <laughs> moved the sound away. Um, uh, what you do is you think about um, a situation in your life, which can be work or um, social or family, anything at all. But it's a situation which you feel stuck you're not sort of making much progress. Now, um, some people never have those situations, but I always have plenty <laughs> that I can think about. Um, so are you thinking about something like that? Well, right now? Yeah. Um, let me think. Yeah, I can think. So why do you think about that? We'll also ask our listeners to do it. Yeah. Think about a situation in which you feel stuck. And then we're going to give that embodied expression. So we're going to actually imagine that we can use our bodies to demonstrate that stuckness. So we're going to create a sculpture of the very feeling of stuckness that I have. So um, I had an experience of it today. I've organised... Um, a module one of my training program and I've got a fantastic group and I'd also like to put it out to a few more people and I thought that what I need to do is create a much sm shorter description because I tend to do a full comprehensive description mm -hmm. which is great for people who already want to come but for people who just want to get you know a little taste of it it's not so good because they don't read very much now right, right, right. Um, and I just couldn't bring myself to do it <laughs> I didn't really understand why. Was I tired? Am I no good at writing short things? You know, I didn't know why I couldn't do it. And I have still not done it. <laughs> but I'm not feeling so bad now because I've had a little break. Anyway, um, so what, that's just an example of something I'm stuck on. Uh, so what I'm going to do to demonstrate, and I ask you all to think of your own issue and then do the same thing. Um, I'm going to think how I can use my body to demonstrate to myself how stuck I feel and also to demonstrate to other people. Is it all right if I stand up or not? Yeah. yeah well, I don't know whether I'll be at the right yeah. level for the sound. Um, so here I am. You wait one second, There you go, start again. So now I'm explaining it and then I'll go silent, okay? So I'm going to do the sculpture to show you how very stuck I feel. And then after, while I'm doing that sculpture, I'll write, I'll say just one sentence which describes my current experience. Then I'll exaggerate the stuckness until I can't bear it any longer. So the stuckness turns into movement. And that movement is called the transition. And it's the transition from the first sculpture to the second sculpture. And I just go on moving, or you just go on moving, for perhaps a half a minute or a minute until you naturally come to a still point. And then that will be sculpture too. And there again, I will just say one sentence. Okay. And if you would be good enough, we always have a scribe when we do stuck activities. Yeah. Uh, if you would be good enough to write down the one sentence that I say in the first sculpture and the one sentence that I say in the second sculpture. Okay, I've got a pen and paper. So I'll just describe that again. I'm going to do a sculpture to, sh to, to demonstrate how stuck I felt. When you, when you say sculpture, you mean you're going to make a shape with your body? I'm going to make a shape with my body, thank you. <laughs> That's what I mean, exactly. I'll try and remember that for another time. Um, then I'm going to say one sentence which describes my current um, feeling. Then I'm going to exaggerate the stuckness till I can't stay stuck any longer. And I'll have to move into some sort of loosening or movement. The loosening or movement is called the transition from sculpture one to sculpture two. So I'll move in transition for, you know, half a minute or a minute until I come naturally to a new stillness. And the new stillness will be called sculpture two. And again, I'll take up that position and I'll say 
a sentence which describes that experience. Perfect. And very often afterwards, somebody like you, Ashley, maybe you can do this for me, you might say, what insights did you get or, you know, how did that help? Okay. Okay? So now I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm silenced and inactive. I've come to stillness again, so my sentence is, what a relief to be free again. What a relief to be free and moving. And did, you, did you feel any insight through that process? Um... I feel a bit dizzy now. That was quite, <laughs> quite extreme. Um, well, I really felt an insight about the stuckness that um, somehow I was doing it to myself. And I was, no wonder I couldn't do anything because I was like, I was almost in a straight, straight jacket. Mm. And the movement, which became more and more free, like a dance, really, mm. reminded me how much I like to be free and how much I like to move. Um, and it probably, the one insight is I was probably silly to go on trying this morning. Mm. I should have just gone out and walked or run or done the things I like to do. Being free. Because there was, being free, because there was no results from trying. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's uh, even telling you that and laughing with you makes me feel a bit better. And then the other insight was um, so that was the insight that actually it would have been better to go out this morning after trying for an hour or two, you know, not to keep going. And the other insight was all I need to do is move. So perhaps I try one small thing every day to yeah. spread the word about my program. And I don't try to do any more than that. There we go. That's my, that's my latest insight. There we go, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and everybody else. Um, that was a live example of Jenny using the embodied experience to gain some knowledge about something she was stuck on in her life. Just a small thing, but a good example and something that everyone can try at home. And actually, I don't know if this would be relevant or not, but I do have a um, video clip of Arowana Hayashi demonstrating that same thing, uh, which only takes three or four minutes. So if you want that, I can get you the is that, either the video clip or I can get you the link to it. Is that on your website? I don't think it's on my website. Okay. I do use it in training, so you may well have seen it because you've done something But if, like if people go online and search for Arowana Hayashi stuck activity... Yeah, they might find it there. They'll certainly, uh, they'll certainly find plenty on Arowana, and they would find something on on the stack activity. Whether they'd find an actual clip of her demonstrating, I'm not sure, because okay. it's only five minutes, and she, but she's done it several times, so they might easily. Yeah. Um, anyway, I can give it to you if you want. Okay. That link. Lovely. 